Last minute presentation jitters. You gotta do the power pose, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know everyone's watching, but whatever. Everyone knows I'm a dork, so that's fine. All right, 12.03. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Others may still join. Um, so I want to welcome everyone. I'm Mark Lovern. I am currently chairing the uh, ISOP Education Working Group number four, which is specializing in communication skills. And uh, this is a topic and um, mission that is very close to my heart, as I know it is with our speakers today. Today uh, represents the first webinar that will be sponsored by this working group. There are some others uh, being planned, but I could think of no two better people to present on this topic than, than Stacy uh, Tannenbaum and Pete Bonet both of whom I've known for many years uh, in a variety of settings. Pete, I had the um, good fortune to work together at GSK uh, in the RTP office uh, or site, which has since been closed. And Stacy, I've- In uh, reopened. Well, what, a, a, has it officially reopened? Because I, 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 yeah, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> That's, but, um, and then, uh, Stacy, I uh, actually started interacting with back when she was in graduate school when I was but a lowly technical support uh, specialist for a company called Farsight, which uh, now has was one of the progenitors of the company I now work with, Sitara. But uh, I have had the pleasure of discussing the importance of communication skills in pharmacometrics on numerous occasions with both Stacy and Peter. And I know they share my passion in that regard that, you know, it's one of effective communication is really crucial to our impact of, of, uh, as pharmacometricians. And, you know, Pete has even gone so far as to write a book on the topic. Uh, and so uh, I just think that they're gonna, uh, gonna have a wonderful presentation today on communication in the time of COVID. Before I hand things over to them, I'm gonna share my screen for just a minute uh, to cover a couple technical details. So specifically, um, if you are wanting to chat, no problem, feel free to chat during the presentation. We welcome interactivity. But if you are looking to have a question answered, the place to put it is to click this button you see right here that says Q&A. That way it'll separate out the questions and we will not uh, lose them in the shuffle uh, amongst the, the other chatter. So um, uh, please use this button to submit uh, any questions you may have. We will try to address those uh, either in the course of the presentation or a dedicated Q&A session. Mark, I'm not sure if it's talk. just me, but I'm not seeing what you're pointing at. I think if you are in the Zoom, you can't actually point to the Zoom buttons, but uh, um, it may just okay. be me. No, that's probably uh, okay. okay. So I tried, but there, there you go. Um, so yes, if everybody's clear, there should be a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Use that for login questions and chatting if you want to, like uh, you know, talk amongst the other panelists. One last thing. So uh, right before this meeting, as we were preparing, it greatly illustrated the importance of some of the uh, tips and techniques that. Uh, Stacy and Pete are going to talk about today. One of which is always start a meeting early because we had a little trouble getting Pete into the meeting. And, it, and so if we had waited to the last minute, it would have been a very different presentation. Uh, and so I'm glad we were able to work that out. But uh, I think you're going to, all of us will benefit from uh, the tips and techniques that they have to share with us today. So thank you very much, uh, Pete and Stacy, for doing this presentation. And thank you to all the attendees uh, for participating. I am now going to go on mute so that my dogs don't bother anyone. All right, then I'm going to share my screen. Just give me one second to share the right one. Can you all see the presentation now? Yes. All right. Pete, take it away. Yeah. All right. So first of all, Stacy and I would like to thank Mark and the ISOP Education Committee for inviting us to speak today. 
Heaven knows Stacy and I like to hear ourselves talk. So appreciate the, <laughs> appreciate the invite. Next slide. So as we all know, last year was an important year. Last year, the world changed. What started out as a few isolated cases of this new type of flu rapidly spread around the world. And it's and in March, what seemed like overnight, the world kind of shut down. Airports closed, next slide. Airports closed, cities closed, freeways closed. And who knew that of all the things in the grocery store, the thing we would miss the most was toilet paper. And overnight, we went from working in our offices to working from our home. Travel was canceled, in-person meetings were gone, coffee or lunch with our colleagues and team members overnight beca became a thing of the past. And our communication child style changed. Our work attire changed a lot not necessarily for the better sometimes. And all of a sudden our meetings became electronic. All of our interactions were now virtual, teleconferences, meetings, webinars, video chats, text messages, everything was virtual. We were all at home. Now, it's not like these things weren't around before they were, but the way we use these tools changed. Rather than supplementing our communication, these tools became the way we communicated. These were the tools we used to meet the way we communicated, even with video conferences, which are as close as you can get to a face-to-face -face conversation. It's not the same. And we're gonna talk about that in our presentation later. So what we hope to do today is highlight some of the challenges that we face in our all electronic communication world brought on by COVID, but also to provide some solutions for how to clarify your message, improve connections and select the best electronic medium for your communication objective. First, we're gonna to touch on making virtual multi-person teams better. And then we're gonna to pivot to interpersonal two-way communication with your colleagues. And then we'll give some tips for your virtual one-way presentation like webinars, how to make them more engaging, more effective. And there's a lot to cover. So right now I'm gonna hand it over to Stacy for her to get us started. Stacy. All right, thanks Pete. I'm really happy to be here with all of you today in another virtual meeting, yay. Since the pandemic started, we have had a million virtual meetings. WebEx, Teams, Skype, GoToMeeting, Zoom stock soared. We all got personal accounts. And at first, virtual meetings were a reasonably effective replacement for in-person ones. We learned how to mute and unmute, share our screens, change our virtual backgrounds, even add filters to touch up our appearance with varying levels of success. And do me do yourself a favor, if you haven't seen these, look up Lawyer Cat and Potato Boss because they are hilarious. You know, Zoom was exciting and we had all these team building activities and coffee chats and happy hours. They were fun, they were new. And in fact, my social life actually improved for the first couple of months of the pandemic. However, over time, even social Zoom meetings became unappealing and exhausting to us. Why is that? Well, first, there's no change in venue. Same screen, same chair, same desk, same office. There's no moving between rooms like there is at work. And as a result, there's also no transit time needed anymore between our meetings. You basically hang up from one and you click into the next one. There's no time to process what's discussed. And there are so many meetings. We've gone from two or three a day to five to 10 because previously impromptu chats with colleagues are now scheduled virtual meetings. So even the chance to informally catch up with friends can be a slog at the end of the day, because I don't know about you, it's another Zoom meeting, I'm burned out. So this is a real phenomenon. If it feels like video calls are more exhausting, it's because they are. A 2008 study by Farron and Watts showed that video calls increased the cognitive demand on their participants so much more than the same event in person. We're going to touch on a few reasons for that. One issue is that Zoom conversations are not natural. It is very rare that you're in a large group where only one person can talk at a time. So if you think about a social gathering, you're used to naturally shifting your attention 
right and left between conversations and even moving around the room to talk to people, but you can't do that in Zoom. Everyone's in a fixed space and everyone's listening to a single speaker. So with one person holding the floor, sometimes it's awkward to interrupt or it's hard to get the attention of the group. So ideas that pop up could get lost without a chance to get it out in the moment. So maybe instead you share it in the chat or in a text. Your ideas may never make it out to the greater group. Plus, you might miss something important going on in the meeting because you're paying attention to your chat conversation and not the meeting content. The thing is, what do you pay attention to? It's really hard to decide. There's what's being presented, of course, slides and the speaker, but you're also distracted by other people. What books are those in the bookcase behind them? All pharmacometric. What is that cat doing? Why does Rob have a photo of a baby? And even if you're trying to talk to someone directly, you can't actually make true eye contact. For them to feel like you're making eye contact, you have to look directly at your camera, which means you don't see their eyes. So there's no eye contact for you. It, it's really a catch-22. It's just hard to make a real connection through a screen. But you know who you make a lot of eye contact with? Yourself. Some research has shown that we spend more time looking at ourselves than others or even what's being presented. And seeing yourself can be distracting and uncomfortable. It's definitely gonna make you edit your behavior and be less expressive. God, do I really move my hands that much? Yes, I do. You see a lot of people fixing their hair. You see a lot of people changing their posture, perhaps to hide a double chin. But you rarely think about how you look when you're talking to someone face to face. It's just not in your mind. The one great feature of some platforms, including Zoom, you can hide your video from yourself. This feels so much more natural. This way you can keep your camera on, but you don't distract yourself with yourself. But instead, here's what happens. People turn off their camera, makes them more comfortable. But to me, it feels very weird to talk to a bunch of black boxes. It feels like the equivalent if we were in a face-to-face -face meeting of people coming into the meeting and putting a bag over their head. It just doesn't make sense. We need to set the norm in meetings that cameras will either all be on or all be off. Now, we all know what the danger of having cameras off is. No one's seeing you. You're more prone to drift off. You're more prone to multitask. You might not even stay in the room. You know, go to the bathroom, go make a sandwich. But multitasking is probably one of the major reasons that we are burning out. It's rare that we're not doing other things when we're in the meeting. I don't wanna see a show of hands right now, but how many of you are checking your email, working on other documents, texting to colleagues, et cetera? If you are, don't do that, not today. Um, but our brains are trying to focus on multiple things at the same time, and we aren't wired that way. This causes our brains to expend a lot more energy than normal. And we're certainly not engaged in our meetings if we're doing other things. So what can we do? Meetings aren't going away. And for the most part, many of us are gonna continue working at home. First, I know this is easier said than done. Try to stop multitasking. Yeah, I know, we're all so busy. But hopefully based on your learnings today, you'll have fewer and more productive meetings. And just bear with me, if everyone focuses on the meeting at hand and stays engaged, the solution or decision is going to come sooner. And guess what? The meeting will end early. Voila, more time to get your work done. So first, help you help you. I don't know about you, I am a world-class multitasker. My friends all know that I'm probably playing solitaire or check an email while we're on the phone. So remove your distractions, close Outlook, close your instant messenger programs. And if you're tempted to pay Candy Crush or check social media, move your phone from the room. If feasible, even move yourself from the room. Move yourself with your laptop to a room with fewer distractions. And if there isn't a presentation or materials that are being shared and the cameras are off, consider just shutting down your monitor, just listening. Take your laptop to the exercise bike or the treadmill, or just march in place, dance. Trust me, who's watching? Okay, you guys are. But you'll get some bonus exercise while you're at it. And if you can't exercise, just try standing up. I am standing up right now. It changes your energy levels. I got a standing desk with a wobble board, which I'm not standing on now so I can move around, but I really like it. Sometimes just moving your body in this repetitive way can actually help kind of bring your mind up to do its thing. You may end up more engaged in the meeting just by natural default. Getting better at focusing 
is not easy. It's just like being a good presenter. It takes training and it takes practice. There's a couple methods here that we can touch on, but there's so many others. One is the Pomodoro method. It was designed by an Italian developer, Francesco Cirillo in the 1980s. It's named after those little tomato or Pomodoro in Italian uh, kitchen timers. So you would turn it and I guess it's for 25 minutes. So with this method, you promise yourself to focus for 25 minutes and then you reward yourself with a five minute break at the end. You know it's coming, so it allows you to focus better. Many people tout meditation as a great way to help improve their focus. And time blocking is a time management tool. You divide your day into blocks of time and each is dedicated to accomplishing a specific task or group of tasks and only that. So perhaps you could time block your meetings or time block some of the other stuff that you need to get done. Do your own research. There are apps, methods, tools for productivity and focus all over the place. Find the one that works for you and then practice. So these are some tips for being an engaged meeting participant. But what about tips for meeting hosts? We have all been to meetings, <laughs> including this one, where technical issues take up way too much time and resources. So as Mark said, log in early. But ultimately what happens is this ends up distracting everyone and rushing the real important content. So I'd like to suggest that you consider having a platform facilitator. Their sole job is to manage the administration of the platform. This frees up the host to get going on time and focus on the meeting business. This is something that we do in our Toastmasters meeting. We have one person that is responsible for administering the Zoom. So the platform facilitator may or may not be a participant in the discussion or decision. It may be even better if they're not so they can completely focus on administration. Some things they can do are troubleshoot the technology. So one-on-one -on -one with individuals or just deal with some of the, the IT issues. They can mute and unmute participants. They can let people in from the waiting room. They can make people presenters, set up polls and use other platform tools, monitor the chat and manage breakout rooms. So consider having this if you're going into a meeting where it's really important that you get stuff done and that you're not distracted by handling the intricacies of Zoom or whatever your platform is. Now I mentioned breakout rooms. Uh, these are a really nice feature of many meeting platforms and they can be used to engage participants and generate a lot more ideas than a large group discussion for some of the reasons we talked about before. Now we've all used Zoom breakout rooms. They're, they're decent, but they do have some limits. So consider trying other platforms. So here's two that we might consider. I'm sure there are many others out there. Um, on the left-hand side is AirMeet. Um, so this is me and Bern Maibom. We're at the AAPS mentoring breakfast. What's really cool about this is that they actually have little tables. So I'm not sure how well you can see it. Oops, hopefully you can. They have little tables here. And each one of those little blocks represents a person who is sitting at the table. So you can hover over the block and their bio pops up so you can see who's there. And then when you join the table by taking one of the empty seats, it pops you into a breakout room. So the best part about this is that you can leave the breakout room and hop to other tables at will. This is a lot nicer than Zoom breakout rooms, which are generally controlled by the host. It's a lot more natural. Now, spatial chat is something I haven't tried before, but several of my colleagues have tried and really recommend. It's even more natural in that you can actually move around the room. When your icon gets close to another person or a group, what happens is the volume of the discussions in your proximity turn up and the volume of the other voices turn down. So it's really very much like a cocktail party where as you move closer, you can join conversations. It's very much more natural. Um, you can join and leave conversations in groups at will, just like in a real networking event. You can even create your own breakout room for private discussions. So like I said, I haven't tried this yet, but I'm really looking forward to checking it out. So we've talked a lot about meetings, but here's the big question I want you to ask yourself. Do you really need a meeting? We tend to default to setting up a meeting for everything, but a meeting should be a forum for discussion and interaction. How many times have you attended a meeting where someone just reviewed a document or a set of slides that they could have and maybe already did email to the participants. I don't know about you guys, but I learned how to read when I was a kid. Or maybe you've been at a meeting where just a couple of people, maybe two or three people were required to solve a problem or make a decision. You aren't one of those necessary people, but you were invited by default because you're on the team. Maybe instead just invite the necessary people and then send out a meeting summary to the rest. You could even have a very short meeting for the other people 
to make sure that there, if there are any lingering questions that you can ask them. So before you set up a meeting, think about it first. If there's a need to engage others in real time, come to a consensus decision, brainstorm ideas or solutions, clarify roles and responsibilities, conduct a Q&A, interact. By all means, have that meeting. But make sure you've done your homework as a meeting host. Provide the tools needed for the meeting participants to make the most of it. And what are those tools? First of all, goals. Why are we having this meeting? Sometimes it's not clear. Uh, I, I've had meetings where I'm just like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be here for. So be clear on what problem you're trying to solve and what decision needs to be made. And if you can't answer those questions, maybe you don't need a meeting. If you do have a meeting though, have an agenda. Have participants assigned to agenda items if that's appropriate and put duration for topics. If you need to get through a certain amount of material, make sure that you've set aside enough time for those discussions. Set the ground rules. Cameras on, cameras off, muting or unmuting. How do you how do you get the attention of the speakers? Do you raise your hand? Do you use the little emoticons on the bottom? Do you use the chat, etc.? Include these in the meeting invite and agenda so everyone knows when you come in that that's the plan. Also, this is where you might want to assign your uh, Zoom host or your your uh, facilitator. Have someone take notes. And it shouldn't necessarily be the person running the meeting because we need to have a structured format to capture decisions, actions, including who and what, and key discussion points. For the people who didn't come to the meeting but need to know what happened, this is a really important document. And lastly, think about your participants. And I can tell you, you will never have this much fun at any of your meetings, no matter how cool you are, I'm sorry. But who to invite is important and who not to invite maybe even more so. So if someone can just read the meeting minutes and get the information that they need, you don't need to invite them. Now, there are political reasons sometimes why you should or must invite someone. So if you're not, in, uh, if you're not comfortable omitting them entirely, consider asking them for input ahead of time and just let them know how you're going to share the meeting outputs when the meeting is over. And lastly, consider making meetings shorter. You don't need the full hour. Consider actually putting them on the calendar for 50 or 55 minutes instead of 60. People are going to appreciate some breathing space between meetings. So if you're going to have a meeting, have these things. I am now giving you guys homework. When you go back to your desk after this, don't look at your calendar now. That's multitasking. Evaluate your calendar. Look at the meetings that you set up. Are they necessary? What's the objective? Can they be shorter? Can you uninvite certain people or are you missing someone? Who can help you with the administration? Can it be an email? And for meetings you're invited to, look, is the meeting objective clear? Do you have an active role? Is your presence even required? I give you permission to find these things out. And if you find out you don't need to be there, delete that meeting. Yay, now you have more time and you don't need to multitask. All right. So we've talked about meetings a lot because they take up a good part of our working day and our energy. But there is still a very important part of communication in the time of COVID, and that's interpersonal communication, talking to your colleagues. We no longer casually interact the way that we used to. As Pete said, no lunches, no coffees, no happy hours. And that is a great loss. It's not just for collaborative relationships and idea generation, but just for the good old team building and social ties. I want you guys to think about the comment section on a social media post, especially about something that people feel very strongly about, like whether Chicago or New York have the best pizza. No comment. When people feel strongly about a topic, they are a lot more likely to act and react accordingly and dash off an inappropriate or emotional comment. People often respond very differently than they would if they were in a face-to-face -face conversation. Even if you know your recipient, you're kind of electronically influenced seeing or feeling their interpretation in real time. So given that we're only having electronic communications now with our colleagues, this mindset can translate to our daily interactions at work to not necessarily good effect. Let's say you're having a so-so day, you're distracted, you're busy, you're overworked, you're frustrated with a project, you can't connect to Zoom. You get an email from a colleague that just kind of 
rubs you the wrong way. So rather than confirming what you interpreted or clarifying their statements, you dash off some sarcastic or flippant response. And they respond accordingly, but more annoyed, and so on, and so on, and so on. There goes your good wor working relationship up in flames. Worse yet, maybe you've both been replying all to the other recipients. And they're also impacted by this behavior and attitude. One or both of them, one or both of you, may lose hard-won credibility or respect from your team members. Or possibly, maybe worse, team members might take sides in the argument or get involved. And this can further fracture team dynamics. Flame wars can really cause a huge mess. Now, assuming that this was a coworker that you used to be located with when you were in the office, you probably never would have gotten to this point. Maybe after the first message that irritated you, you could have popped into their office and said, hey, I wanna make sure I'm understanding what you said in that email. Did you mean X? And maybe they did or maybe they didn't, but then you know, and you can respond appropriately. Or maybe once you see the flames starting to flicker, you go, hmm, go to their office. Can we grab a coffee? I think we're heading down the wrong path, but we can't do this now because we're not in the office. So you know what is a really good fire extinguisher? A phone. And for those of you youngsters that are listening, this is what phones used to look like. The point is, is that you need to connect directly and personally, as if you would go to your colleague's office. And please do it sooner than later before things get even more out of hand or escalated to senior management or worse. An even better venue for this discussion might be a one-on-one -on -one video call. Because by looking at someone's face and their body language, you are going to take in so much more than their words to help you interpret what they really mean. If you see that they're frustrated, they're concerned, it's going to make you more empathetic when you're having this conversation because you're going to realize you're not talking to a disembodied email recipient, you're talking to a colleague who cares as much as you do. So think about these things before things get out of hand. Another tip for putting out these fires before they start, watch your tone. Your angry reaction to an email may very well be appropriate, but maybe it's a misunderstanding, maybe it's a poor word choice, or worse yet, maybe it's an attempt at humor that fell flat because you weren't receptive to it or you didn't recognize it. Tone can be really hard to read, especially if you are the reader and you're in a moment of emotion or distraction. This is one argument for the use of emojis or punctuation like exclamation points, if you get an email from me, it's probably going to include both. Now, in business communication, it may seem maybe too casual or silly to use happy faces in your emails or instant messages, but it can really help the reader to interpret tone or context of a statement. In fact, true story. When I am all amped up and I'm venting to Pete about something, I can't recognize the sarcasm in his response in the moment, and then I get even more bent out of shape. Now, this is someone I have known for 20 plus years, and of course he's being sarcastic. It's Pete. So now Pete just writes the word emoji <laughs> at the end of his text as my alert. I mean, it's better than nothing, right? At least he knows he's putting some tone in there. So before you hit send, and this is true, he really does write emoji. Uh, before you hit send, think about how your words will be interpreted. So if you read it through a different lens, make sure that your tone and your intent is clear. Now, so far we've talked about one-on-one -on -one interactions but staying connected to your teams and your groups is equally important in this work at home world. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Pete now, and he's gonna share some tips on how to facilitate this. Pete? Oh, sorry, I was texting my wife about dinner plans. Um, well, so one of the things, in addition to our relationships with our colleagues that's been affected in how we work on, on a daily basis, you know, one of the things the pandemic has also had an effect on is our, we'll call them secondary friendships. Um, so these are the friendships uh, that you might have with people that you might meet in the hallway uh, while you're at work or bump into um, in the elevator or in the coffee room or in the cafeteria. You know, they're, they're people that you don't really work with on any projects, but they're people that you see in the building and, you know, that you've struck up conversations with many times and, and you've kind of become sort of sort of friends with them. Um, working at home, those relationships are mostly gone because, you know, we, we just don't see those people anymore. 
Um, so what can we do to bring that back? Well, I, you know, I thought this was a really cool idea when I read about it. Some companies are starting to bring back, well, they're, they're, they're creating what are called virtual water cooler rooms. And, and basically these are Zoom rooms that are on, you know, like 10 hours a day. And people can pop in, they can pop out anytime they want to. There's no agenda. You can just go in there and just see people and just talk to people when you feel like you need to talk to someone. Um, some places um, are getting a little bit more creative. They're, they're putting water cooler rooms on each floor of the building uh, so that you're more likely to meet people that, that you used to work with on the same floor. Um, so that's just kind of a kind of a cool idea that that uh, some companies are doing to try and bring back, you know, the, those secondary relationships that we used to have at work. You know, and if you're a manager, you could expand on this idea. Um, and instead of having like one on ones, maybe just offer scheduled office hours where you're on the call for a couple hours at a time. And if people want to pop in and talk to you, um, they can't. It's a little bit more spontaneous than you know the, the the rigorous meeting schedule that that we're used to and having some of that spontaneity makes things uh, a little bit better another thing that you can try is a virtual fika now if you aren't european you may not know what a fika is and even if you are european you might not know what a fika is uh, fika is a swedish term it most people think it's kind of a coffee break, but it's, it's kind of more than that. For the Swedes, fika is, is a way of life. A way of life. Um, it literally translates into coffee and cake break. And Swedes take a fika break every single day. And I'd like to thank an old colleague of mine, Jan Stefan Vanderwall, to introduce me to this term because he started introducing fikas um, in our European office a few years ago. And but the point of it is, you know, you don't do this alone. You have it with others. You take a break and you socialize, you break, you know, you break bread, you have some drinks together. It's about slowing down and meeting colleagues and, you know, kind of enjoy what's going on in your life. So you might hear the Swedes say, let's go in fika. Um, so maybe you can figure out a way to, to get a fika in your life. And some of us are starting to go back to the office. Some of us full-time, some of us part-time on a hybrid basis, but it's not gonna be the same, is it? I mean, and I think we all know it's not gonna be the same. Uh, we're gonna have to get our temperatures checked as we walk through the door. We're, we're still gonna have to wear masks. Uh, it's just gonna be different. And one of the problems with wearing masks, next slide, is, you know, we might not consider this, but there are some things to consider when you're wearing a mask and you're trying to talk to people. And here's a few things just to kind of point it out to you. Remember that most communication is nonverbal, particularly around our eyes and around our mouth. And when you have the mask, you can't see people smiling. You can't see their lips read, you know, so really you're, you're limited to the eyes. So, so be aware that you know, the, the nonverbals that you might use to use, which are really kind of subconscious, you might not even be aware you're putting them out. People just don't have access to those. So they're really relying on what you say. And that's going to have to make you work a little bit harder in your conversations. The mask, as we all know, also makes it difficult for us to understand people. So, um, you know, be conscious and work a little bit harder to enunciate the words and, and speak louder to be heard. Also, don't forget uh, about people that might be hard of hearing or deaf. You know, they can't, if you're deaf, they can't read your lips. They, they can't see what you're saying. Um, I can only imagine how difficult a time this is for them with, with everybody wearing masks. But just kind of be aware that, that not everybody can hear you and, and understand you clearly. So maybe talk a little bit slower, enunciate a little bit more when you wear those masks in meetings. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Stacy to talk a little bit about webinars and recorded presentations. Thank you, Pete. Talk this presentation has been about the fact that we're already burning out on Zoom. And when you're giving a recorded presentation in a webinar, you're asking people to spend even more time on the computer to come to your talk. So you need to make your presentation people feel 
good about prioritizing and spend their limited time on. So the biggest tip I have, and if you've seen this slide before, it's because I used it in one of my old webinars, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, the biggest tip is make the first moments of your talk really count. If you don't hook them in the first couple of minutes, they're gonna phase out and do other things. Now, one of the reasons it's so important to be engaging is that there's a lot of competition right now. There's a webinar every day, it seems, including this one, so thank you for coming. You wanna to work to make sure that yours is worth spending time on. Now, this presentation is live, as you know, but most of the virtual conferences that I have been to this year have required that the presentations be recorded. And honestly, I think this has not done us any favors with regard to engagement. You may think they're really similar. How are recorded presentations different than live ones? But let me give you a real example. If you were at ACOP 8 for the first innovation and communication session, you will remember Pete's presentation on the extreme value theorem. Complete with the pink tutu, Vladimir Putin, the sock puck that <laughs> um, it was an absolute blast. But believe it or not, it didn't actually start out that fun. Pete wanted to show how the use of video can enliven a presentation. And I think he did a great job at that. But to do this, he initially recorded a YouTube style video that he planned to show at the event. So he asked me to watch it and give him feedback. Content was great. It was the same content that he showed at the event. But the fact that it was fully recorded, it didn't allow the Pete-ness of Pete to come through. It was narrated. It was scripted. It was a little boring. Sorry, Pete. Um, I gave him this feedback and you saw the outcome. So what can the rest of us learn from this? Well, first of all, I don't know about you, but when someone points a camera at me, even if I'm smiling for real, my smile immediately becomes fake. It's human nature. If you're being recorded, you change how you look and act. I also start blinking uncontrollably when someone puts a camera in my face. So just don't tell me you're taking my picture. It's going to be fine. But you become more self-conscious when you know you're being looked at. And just like in Zoom meetings, when you're recording a presentation, you're going to focus on how you look on camera, which means you're going to move your head and hands less. You're going to use fewer facial expressions. You're trying to be professional. Plus, you know this is being saved for all posterity. So if you screw up, it's out there forever. There's already that added tension and nervousness that is going to make you obsess about the delivery of the presentation. You want to be perfect and polished and scripted. So this is going to make you limit your vocal variety. It's going to limit your speed. It's going to limit your tone. But these are the things that give a presentation life, moving, having vocal variety, having different speeds. I can tell you from experience, it's also going to take you forever to record it. Because every time you flub or you use a filler word, you're going to be so uber aware, it's going to distract you. You're going to stop recording. You're going to start that slide over. You're going to become even more rigid. And the overall presentation will feel disjointed and low on energy. And you know what low on energy means? Boring, 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 lifeless. People are going to check out. People come to your presentation because they're interested in the content. They're not coming to see you. They're coming to see the content. Well, today you're coming to see us, but you know we're different. Um, but please do not chase them away by sucking the energy out of your delivery. Don't be an energy vampire. If you don't know who this is, go watch what we do in the shadows. It's hilarious. Okay, so what do we do? If you don't feel comfortable recording the presentation and being natural, consider recording it on Zoom and actually inviting people to listen. Invite a few colleagues or friends to listen to your presentation live. Record the presentation that you give in real time. This might take your mindset from I am recording content to I'm presenting content and it just happens to be recorded. Because stopping and perfecting is not an option in a live presentation. If you flub, you flub. So you can't say, oh, sorry guys, wait, I'm gonna start this slide over. It's just gonna free you up to be yourself and present as normal. I'm sure I flubbed during this presentation, but whatever. Those who watch the recorded presentation will appreciate seeing a real person someone who moves their hands too much like me, someone who has a few flaws. It's going to make you more relatable and more engaging. Like I said, these are the things that give your presentation energy. People will stick around to watch as opposed to checking out. Now, some of this may sound a little familiar. 
because Pete and I have talked about this before in a previous webinar. So I'm going to turn it back to Pete to recap that. He's going to give you a few more tips on virtual presentations and take us through to the finish line. Thanks, Stacy. In 2017, uh, Mark, again, uh, invited us to speak on giving better webinars. We called it speaking into the ether because when you're giving webinars, you can't really see the audience. You're, you're just kind of talking into thin air. And I'm going to strongly encourage, encourage all of you, if you haven't seen it, or even if you've already seen it, to please go back and watch it again. And I'm just going to say that over the last year and a half, it's clear to me that many people did not watch this presentation. You know who you are. If you haven't seen it, it's on Sertara's website, it's on YouTube, and I'm not going to go over the whole presentation. I'm just going to kind of hit some of the high points that we talked about in that presentation. So Stacy and I, we kind of focused on two areas. We focused on content and focused on delivery. With regards to content, some of the important things to remember are get their attention immediately. Because, you know, within the first, I would say, couple of minutes, people are going to decide whether they're going to watch your video or not. Are they going to start checking their email or not? So you got to get their attention immediately. If they don't watch your presentation, make sure to state your message up front so they at least get the high points of what it is that you're trying to say. Don't keep it like a murder mystery where they have to wait to the end to find out what your conclusions are. Put it right up front. Try different things to get their attention. Try new and unusual graphics. You know, here's a, a cat plot that, uh, that we found on the internet. And if you've got a really long presentation, you know, try and break it up. Find ways to break it up. Um, include maybe, you know, surveys in between sections or, you know, something to try and break it up. Just to make it more digestible. The other thing that we focused on was delivery, because while content is important, it's the delivery, I think, that keeps people there. Because, again, you're competing against multitasking. And what happens when you're multitasking? So people are looking at other screens. They're not even looking at your content, but they're listening to you. They're listening to how you present. So if you can talk in an engaging and compelling way, that's really gonna keep people, even if they're multitasking, they'll pay attention to what you're saying. So we talked about really the importance of delivery, how to connect to your audience when you can't see them, um, you know, some of the challenges that a speaker faced. As I, as I said, there's no visual or verbal cues. I'm looking at a TV screen right now. Uh, I can't even see how people are reacting to what I'm saying, if they're nodding off or if they're, you know, if they look engaged, you know, so that, that presents a real challenge to the speaker. We talked about trying to address confusion before it begins. And, you know, and, and again, just remember, you know, webinars don't have to be one-way engagements. And I realize, you know, as we're saying this, this is kind of a one-way engagement. We didn't really have any surveys in here, but audience participation certainly brings up, um, you know, and increases the, the engagement with the audience. Oh, and there's that cat from our webinar. And lastly, don't forget yourself. And, and we talk about this a lot because it's your voice that really keeps people engaged when you're giving a presentation, even, even in a face-to-face -face presentation, your voice is so extremely important. And, and so when you're talking, don't forget about your role in the presentation. So learn to modulate your speech. We talked about using the green eggs and ham exercise to uh, learn how to change the speed and the rhythm, the, you know, the duration of, of words that you use, how to pause between words to, you know, to kind of get emphasis on what it is that you're trying to say. We talked about modulating pitch and tone. So there's a lot of, lot of exercises that you can do to, to learn to be better in that regard. And lastly, you know, don't forget things like you know, sit up straight or stand up straight. You, you know, speak from your diaphragm, speak from the back of your throat from instead of like the front of your throat. And always, always use a voice recorder. Listen to yourself, give a presentation and learn from it. You, you'd be surprised what you can hear when, when you actually hear yourself speak afterwards. Now, these are some new things that we've learned over the last year. Um, first, 
if we're going to be working from home, invest in some better equipment, right? We, our laptops all have cameras. They all have microphones. But those are like bargain basement cameras, bargain, bargain basement microphones. Buy yourself an external camera. Get something a little better than the 720p you know, cameras that come with laptops. Get yourself a real microphone. Uh, the audience will appreciate it. You will sound better. You'll look better. And um, things will go a lot smoother. And, and, and don't forget the light ring. I, I, I say that um, because I'm using a light ring right now. Uh, without the light ring, I look like a pumpkin. So um, consider getting yourself a light ring and uh, make yourself look a little better. It can make a huge difference in how you look and, and how you present, removes unwanted shadows and colors, and, it's, and just gives a better experience to the people on the other end. One of the nice things about external cameras is that you can place it wherever you want. So think about camera placement. You know, if you use your laptop computer, you get what I call the, you know, the great Oz look where um, everybody's kind of looking up at you. You know, you got to make sure your nose hairs are trimmed because they can see that. And um, at least with an external camera, you can put it somewhat at eye level. Um, things, you know, it tends to look more natural in the way you talk. And again, Stacy talked about, you know, they're, they're even, even doing that, there are some difficulties with trying to make on eye contact. So, you know, look at the camera, uh, instead, you know, instead of looking at the screen when you can, it just looks more normal. So think about camera placement and, and how to make it look more natural. And we also talked about the distractions behind you. You know, we, we, um, you know, during the pandemic, we saw um, th there was just a plethora of people on television sitting in front of, you know, gigantic bookcases of books. Um, and people can get distracted by that, particularly if they can read uh, the titles of the books, you know, because they're like, oh, well, what does that person like to read? So instead of focusing on you, they're looking behind you. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, you got your cat walking behind you or, you know, whatever. I mean, all the distractions behind you, people are paying attention to. So there are things that you can do, you know, certainly with, with Zoom, you can blur the background, you can add an image, you can see the image that I, um, that I have here. Um, I don't know if I can turn this off, but anyways, you know, behind me, um, you know, I've got my, my wall and some, you know, and some plants behind me, but think about a background image to kind of make it so they focus on you instead of what's behind you. And if you, and, and I know that the blur, the blur or the background image, sometimes it doesn't look quite right on people. Um, you know, sometimes your hair looks weird and stuff like that. So if that doesn't work, consider like a physical screen that, you know, that you can put behind you, um, to just kind of block out some of the distractions that might uh, might be present. Now, as you leave this, uh, there are a few key takeaways that I want you, uh, that Stacy and I would like you to remember. Uh, and the first is practice, practice, practice. I can't state this enough. Practice until you're sick of it. Um, we've all had presentation disasters where we haven't been fully prepared. Practice from the beginning, practice from the end, practice from the middle, just practice until you know your presentation cold, but not necessarily rote. You know, you don't want it to sound scripted. Just know what you want to talk about on every slide, know what the high points are, know what you're going to say. You know, you don't want to freeze up uh, in the presentation. You want to appear natural and confident in your presentation. Remember that Zoom burnout is real. I mean, we, we talk about it, we think about it, and, you know, and, and we're all agreeing, you know, with, we all feel the same way. You know, we're all, we're all burned out from this. It's, it's hard to keep going. Um, but there are things that we can do. You know, we can, as hosts, we can try and make things a little more compelling, a little more engaging. And certainly as participants, there are things that we can do to keep energy levels up. Even just as simple as just standing up um, during a presentation will help do that. Think about whether you want your cameras on or off. Um, just re you know, remember that Zoom burnout is real and there are things that you can do about it. And lastly, um, 
th you know, before you go out and send that email, before you go and schedule that meeting, think about, is this really the best way to do this? You know, is it better for us to maybe have an email or just a quick phone call as opposed to maybe another, another Zoom meeting? So just think about what's the best way to communicate, whether it's email, text, or phone. And with that, uh, Stacy and I would like to thank you for listening. We hope you learned something from this. And then now we will take uh, any questions. Thanks, Pete and Stacy. Uh, we do have a few questions that I will read uh, for the group and then um, you, you can answer. Uh, so I'm, the first one's directed to Stacy. It says, good point, Stacy, asking, do I need to be in this meeting based on the agenda? How do you suggest to rid people of the FOMO, which is fear of missing out culture? I think if you're going to drop out of a meeting, um, make sure that you have a way to get the information. If, if it's an information sharing meeting, if it's a, a meeting where a decision needs to be made a, a amongst a small group of people, there's no FOMO, man. I, I'm happy to not have another meeting. Um, I think if it's one where there, a decision needs to be made and you need to be part of that, by all means, go to that meeting. Um, and if you're not part of it, ask to be part of that meeting if you feel like you need to be part of it. And I think certainly within Pharmacometrics, I think we all suffer from this because a lot of times Pharmacometrics does not sit on the core team. So we are separated from these meetings. Um, but you know, I don't have FOMO. If somebody wants to cancel a meeting on me, man, thank you so much. I have an hour to do something else. Um, but, but find out how you're going to get the meeting outcomes from that and make sure there's going to be meeting minutes or some, uh, you know, email or something that has a summary of the, of the meeting. Ask for that if it's not sent. Great. Thank you, Stacy. So the next question is to the both of you. It says, do you have any ideas on how to make hybrid meetings with office-based and work from home colleagues successful in the next phase slash post pandemic? I'll take this one. Um, I think we've, you know, we've always had hybrid meetings even before we started on the pandemic. I mean, there's always people that have called into meetings that, that couldn't be there. So um, I don't think these hybrid meetings are, are really anything, really anything new. And, and if anything, it, it's always seemed to me that um, with hybrid meetings, you know, the, the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. It seems like we focus more on making sure the people on the phone get what's being said more so than, than the people, you know, the, the, the 15 or 20 people that might actually be in the room. Um, so I think, the, I think the real key to a successful hybrid meeting is, is awareness and balance, you know, just be aware that, the, that you know, that there are people that might not be able to see completely what's going on or, or hear what's going on. Uh, I know that uh, it seems, it's always seemed to me that companies video conferencing or teleconferencing equipment is inadequate. I mean, how many times have we had to move speakers and, you know, because people on the phone can't hear what's going on. I know that at Astellas, we've spent a, a significant amount of money on new equipment to better improve these telecommunications so that does not become an issue. Um, beyond that, I, um, maybe Stacy has some further ideas. Yeah, I got a couple of thoughts. So one is that uh, platform facilitator and they can monitor the chat and just make sure that if somebody is trying to get the attention of the, of the group um, that they can you know, say, hey, so-and-so has a question on the phone. Um, I think that's a really good way to do it rather than trying to find a time to break in to have somebody who is responsible for, for collecting questions in the chat, similar to what you're doing, Mark. Um, you know, having been in a, in a global company where I was the only person in the US, I will say it's hard um, where the rest of the group is in person and they're talking and you, you really, you do miss out. You do miss out on the conversations and, and kind of the side conversations. It's really up to the meeting host to, to try to make sure that they remember that there are people on the phone and, and to try to pull them in. Um, and for the person who's on the phone to say, if it, just interrupt. If you don't feel like you're having the opportunity to do so, just say, hi, I have a question. It, it is a little uh, uh, abrupt sometimes, but sometimes you need to just jump in there and, and ask the question. Thanks. 
Um, so next question, when presenting to senior leaders, your 30 minute presentation becomes 15 minutes because they're running behind. Do you suggest people have different versions of their presentation, full, half, and five minute key points depending on time limits? Pete, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I always suggest having your key points up front because then if you do run into time issues, you know, you've already stated where you want to go. Uh, I think that might be one thing to do. I, I wouldn't recommend different presentations. It, it seems like a lot of work to do. Just, you know, maybe be aware of which slide is must have and which slide might be uh, nice to have. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, I, you people are, I think, are starting to do is they're either starting meetings 10 minutes, like instead of starting the meeting, like at the hour, they start 10 minutes after the hour. That allows people the opportunity to, you know, have a little break between meetings. Um, alternatively, some people are ending meetings a little bit early uh, so that you can make that next meeting that's on the hour. Um, and <laughs> that's kind of funny. I mean, when we were in high school, this is how they did classes, right? Classes were 50 minutes, but somehow when we moved to the business world, meetings became an hour and there's never enough time to get between meetings. So somehow we, we missed that really basic um, time management concept from uh, in the business world. So I, I would suggest we go back to something like the 50 minute meeting. Great, good points. Um, so we just have a couple more questions. Do you think having participant cameras on during a presentation is helpful? Uh, it can lead to connecting with your audience, but also distractions. Um, you know, it, it depends. So if it's, if it's an information sharing thing, and sometimes you do have to have information sharing at a meeting, it doesn't really matter whether participants are on or off. But if it's something where you're, preparing for a conversation or you you have something that you need to see whether there's agreement on you can actually have you know it does suck up bandwidth to have cameras on so you can ask people to turn their cameras off but use the emojis so there's like little emojis here on, on the bottom oh I just raised my hand I don't know if that works but there's there's a, a emojis on the bottom there you can say you know do a vote um if you're giving something where you need to see if people are engaged or, or getting it and you have a small enough meeting, I don't see a, re a reason not to have cameras on. In Toastmasters, we keep cameras on for everybody. So you can see the reaction for people. Um, you want people to see if they're laughing at your jokes. There's nothing worse than making a joke and then it's just like dead silence. Silence. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think there, there is something to be said for having cameras on during presentations. Depends on the kind of presentation. Um, I know it's not very helpful. It's a little bit vague, but I think it, it depends <laughs> would be my answer. I don't know, Pete, if you have a different one. I, I mean, from my point of view, I'm, I keep my camera on when I want to pay attention. <laughs> so like, if I don't want something, if, if I know I, I, I'm at risk of multitasking, but I really need to pay attention to a presentation, I'll leave my camera on. Because then I think, well, if people are watching me, I'm less likely to play hooky on the meeting because I think it's pretty clear when I start multitasking, um, I'm not really, you know, <laughs> you can see me moving my arms and stuff. So uh, from a participant point of view, I mean, I, I think camera, keeping cameras on is good. I, you know, from the pres presenter point of view, uh, you know, the only people I see right now are Mark and Stacy. I, I can't actually see any of the present, present or any of the participants in this. So I, um, yeah, yeah, that's I a good mean, point. I, I couldn't see any, any, you know, because I only saw my screen. So I didn't actually see the participants, but in some you'll have like the participants, like along the bottom yeah. with the screen. So it, it sort of depends, I think on yeah, the platform. It, it, yeah, it, it kind of depends. Thank you both so much. I think that's all the questions we're going to have time for today. Um, it's been a very helpful presentation. And I, again, thank you. You're welcome. Profusely. Thank you for having us. We had fun. Yep. Thanks everyone for coming. All right. Bye everyone. Bye all.